you know, one of the core things that we have tried to do here in this organization over the last two and a half years is to start becoming more engaged with our cold cases. Cold cases typically sit for months and sometimes even years without being resolved. And so one of the things we were focused on was to create a cold case unit. And I think today, being able to bring to some closure here on cases that had gone back over 20 years speaks to the importance of making sure that we keep this cold case unit going. I'll give you a little backstory uh, about the nature of the cases that was concluded here. Almost 20 years ago, we had three young ladies who were victimized, two in Broward County and one in Miami. The first of which was killed and left packaged in a suitcase in Cooper City. The second of which was a young lady who was also killed and packaged in a duffel bag to be left in Dania Beach. And then the third found its way, a young lady to be floating, left killed in Biscayne Bay. And these type of atrocities, as you can imagine, devastate the community and it devastates the families because they have no closure. All they are left to remember is that their loved one was brutally murdered and killed and discarded with no consideration for the humanity uh, that this individual had. Fortunately, uh, with the nature of science and DNA evidence, our detectives supplemented with the city of Miami was able to bring forth evidence that gave them a potential suspect. And the suspect at the time was Roberto Fernandez. He was an individual who had resided in Miami. He was a um, Brazilian citizen. And unfortunately, before Miami uh, police officers were able to interview and interrogate, had fled the country and found himself back in Brazil. Now, the interesting thing about the nature of how our partnership had worked amongst the sheriff's office and the city of Miami was that this case was going to transcend borders and brought in international implications. And we are very fortunate that both our government here and the partnership that we had with Brazil afforded these men and women an opportunity to further investigate and get to a point where they exhumed the body to connect DNA evidence confirming that uh, this suspect, Roberto Fernandez, was indeed responsible for the brutal murder of all three of these women. I want to just speak on a couple areas here about what's happened over the last 20 years to put this in perspective. A multitude of different detectives, both from the City of Miami and the Broward Sheriff's Office, had worked this case. Some of them retired and some of them even died. But neither one of these organizations, the Sheriff's Office or the City of Miami, have ever lost focus on finding justice for these victims and for the family members. I made a comment earlier um, to Michael, who was here today, uh, as it was his wife that was one of the victims, uh, Michael Livesey, uh, about the importance that justice never expires. And when we have an opportunity to track down individuals, regardless of their local in Broward County or if they're in our neighboring county of Miami, or if they decide to leave this country, then we're going to pursue them. Uh, I have some very introduced uh, and allowed them an opportunity to speak as they have really been the lead on this case, uh, as well as uh, the partnership aspect to be successful here, the first of which I have with me today, uh, Major William Cook, who represents the city of Miami. In addition, I have our detective, detect Detective Zach Scott, and we've also had an opportunity to bring in uh, Sergeant Trifonov, who will also be able to have a take a moment to speak on this. So I really don't want to steal these men's thunder because there's a lot of intricate details about how they got to this point that I think the community want to hear, uh, and they most certainly are deserving to speak of it. So Major, I'll let you step up, sir. Good morning. Thank you, Sheriff Tony. Uh, I represent the City of Miami Police Department, and on behalf of Chief R. Acevedo, I'm here uh, in this wonderful moment to just basically celebrate the uh, accomplishment of collaboration, for one. But number two, as uh, Sheriff Tony pointed out, uh, cold cases is something that does not expire. And our department has also just recently uh, revamped our cold case and expanded the unit. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I just want to introduce 
uh, detective, uh, formerly Detective Trifonoff, who actually worked for me uh, as when I was a sergeant in homicide. But he has an example of what a detective who's properly trained, and now he's the sergeant uh, of the unit who was spearheaded this investigation. Uh, and, and I'm just really proud of him, and, I, and I'm thankful for this opportunity. Uh, but he is going to give you uh, more intricate details on how this actually occurred and, and why we should continue to focus on cold cases going forward. Detect uh, Sergeant Tri Trifonoff. Thank you, Major. Uh, Sheriff Tony, thank you. So uh, I'll, I'll just provide a brief synopsis of um, our investigation um, with our victim, Ms. Jessica Good. On August 30th, uh, 2001, um, our officers responded to the area of 1450 Briggle Bay Drive uh, in reference to a female's body who was floating in the water. Uh, the body was retrieved. Initially, the body was unidentified. It was later identified as uh, the victim, Ms. Jessica Good. Uh, with the uh, assistance of the medical examiner's department, um, Dr. Liu uh, from our medical examiner department performed an autopsy, um, found um, some wounds to the chest, stab wounds, and determined that uh, this was a homicide indeed. Um, at that point, uh, we, we start our investigation where we determined that Ms. Good had a boyfriend who spoke to us and told us that uh, she had spoken to him the night before she went missing, explained to him that she was going on a date uh, with a white Hispanic gentleman who was driving a van and a phone number that was affixed to that van. Um, after speaking with uh, her boyfriend, uh, investigators continued the investigation and uh, spoke with the company uh, owner for that van and uh, determined that there was only one employee that was driving that van at that time. Um, that van was found outside of this gentleman's uh, apartment, um, this being who we later identify as Roberto Fernandez, uh, the offender. Um, a search warrant is conducted on the van and the apartment, and um, we are able to get a DNA profile. Also, DNA was later uh, taken from Ms. Good's fingernails, and that matched the male profile that we had. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we find later that uh, Mr. Fernandez had fled to Brazil and possibly had died in a plane crash in 2005, years later. We had to confirm whether the death was real or not, um, as we take into consideration that people may fake their death, especially after committing our murder, uh, the murders in Broward, and possibly others. Uh, we were able to confirm ultimately that uh, Mr. Fernandez was deceased, the body was exhumed, uh, DNA was taken, and it all matched uh, the profile that was obtained from the apartment and from Mrs. Good's uh, fingernail scrapings. Um, at that time, uh, Broward, um, who was conducting their own investigation throughout this whole time, uh, was able to follow through with their investigation as well, um, concurrently, basically, since their murders occurred prior to ours in 2001. Thank you, sir. Uh, and then I'll also just take a moment and allow, just to give you a little bit more perspective from our side of it, what our investiga investigators are doing. So, Zach, you want to come on up? Good morning. Uh, first thing I want to say is I'm, I'm just the last guy in line on a very long line of detectives who put a lot of work into these investigations, both from Cooper City Police Department originally, Broward Sheriff's Office, City of Miami, uh, obviously the, the crime scene detectives and personnel, and the very dedicated people in our crime labs who can take this evidence from the past and give us answers that we didn't have before. Um, all of them, as the sheriff mentioned, some have retired, some have moved on, some aren't with us anymore. All of them are the reason that we're able to make this announcement today. Um, as the sergeant mentioned, uh, their case involving Jessica Good in 2001 was the last piece that kind of connected all three of these murders. Uh, back in 2000, starting with the uh, death of Kim Livesey and later with the death of Sia Demas, we were able to obtain a DNA profile for an unknown suspect on both of those crime scenes. In addition, we also had a fingerprint uh, from the crime scene of Sia Dimas. 
Uh, unfortunately, traditional methods of submitting that profile and those fingerprints into automated government systems to see if anybody was a match came back with nothing, uh, which usually means it's someone who's not in the system. Um, we were fortunate enough that the case in 2001 that the city of Miami had uh, were, was able to obtain the same DNA profile uh, and then had a name attached. And that's what led us into the investigation identifying Roberto Fernandez as the uh, killer of all three of these victims. Um, that being said, knowing that Mr. Fernandez had fled to Brazil obviously presented a lot of obstacles. We do not have an extradition agreement with Brazil. Uh, evidence that we would require to be able to confirm that he's our suspect was not something that the Brazilian government can obtain unless he was facing criminal charges there. Um, but I will say that as the years have gone by, the government has been uh, nothing but helpful in this investigation, um, partially because Mr. Fernandez's name had come up in several investigations in Brazil as well. Uh, we were fortunate enough that they were able to provide fingerprints based on a previous arrest he had in Brazil. And since those fingerprints didn't exist in the United States, it was a key piece of evidence. Uh, comparing those fingerprints to the evidence from the Jessica Good case, as well as the uh, Ciedemus case, we were able to connect those crimes, uh, but we were still left at a loss as far as obtaining DNA. Um, as was reported in 05, the Brazilian authorities believed that Mr. Fernandez died in a plane crash, but there were a lot of circumstantial uh, things that were discovered in Brazil that led them to believe that he may have faked his own death. Uh, he had amassed a certain amount of enemies in the country of Brazil. Uh, in 1996, he was charged with murdering his wife. Uh, he stood trial for that and was later acquitted on a self-defense claim. Uh, they were able to obtain his fingerprints then, but his late wife's family uh, apparently harbored some ill feelings towards him and it was believed that they had uh, paid others to try to kill him. So he had fled to Paraguay once he had fled the United States after the Jessica Good murder uh, in an attempt to avoid the family. And it's believed that he could have faked his death to avoid further attempts on his life. Uh, there were a lot of questions about who identified the body, how the body got back to Brazil, uh, the plane crash itself occurring in another country. So the first thing that had to be determined if we were going to move forward with anything is if Roberto Fernandez was still alive. So working with the Department of Justice and uh, the Brazilian Central Authority, Brazilian National Police, uh, we were able to convince a provincial judge in Brazil to issue an order of exhumation of the grave believed to belong to Roberto Fernandez. Uh, they were able to locate uh, remains inside the grave and those were compared to a DNA standard, which was then later compared to our crime scene standard, and it was confirmed that he was the suspect in all three of these murders uh, based on that. We were also fortunate that in 2015, uh, there was a homicide that occurred in Palm Beach County. The suspect in that homicide was a Cuban citizen and fled to Cuba after the murder. Uh, much like Brazil, there was no extradition agreement. Uh, in 2018, Cuban authorities arrested him and he stood trial in Cuba for the murder that was committed in Palm Beach. This was unprecedented. It wasn't anything that had been seen before, but it laid the groundwork for us to approach the government of Brazil with the possibility of could we locate Roberto Fernandez, could he stand trial in your country, and they were receptive to the concept. Um, I wish we were up here showing you his mugshot. Uh, unfortunately, we, we were deprived of that pleasure. Uh, knowing his last minutes on earth were probably full of terror makes me feel a little better. Uh, but at least today we can provide answers to the families as far as what happened to their loved ones and the person who was responsible. Sure. Yeah, I can that. Uh, really quickly, I just want to take a moment. You know, one of the things that we really was hoping to do, as you can imagine, is having all the families being able to make this notification. But with the expansion of 20 plus years, it made it a little bit difficult trying to locate the family members for two of the victims. However, we have the husband for one of the victims, and I would um, like to invite him up for a moment, Michael, to speak on behalf of his family and what this means to him, sir. Uh, good morning, my name is Michael Livesey. 
Uh, I'm here on behalf of the family as well as Kim's family. We would like to give thanks for all the tireless work and long hours over these past 20 years. We would like to especially thank and recognize the few that did not give up. There was a detective, David Frisbee, in um, former Cooper City Police Department, uh, Detective Zachary Scott, uh, also a detective, Brian Tutler, uh, of the Broward County Sheriff's Office, the Miami Police Department. I hope I got that one right. Uh, and the entire Broward Sheriff's Office organization. Uh, these men and women never gave up over the course of the past two decades, leading to an internal investigation to solve this horrendous crime. My heart goes out to the other families and loved ones of every victim. I certainly hope that this will give them a sense of closure as it does mine. We have waited 20 years and never thought we would have closure, but the collaboration of all of these law enforcement departments has brought that to us. Thank you to the Broward Sheriff's Office and everyone that helped with this investigation. Broward County is always at our backs. Thank you. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to you all. If you have any specific questions for myself or any of the detectives or major or even Michael, a family member here today. Uh, Just come on up, sir. Yeah. Just get in front of the mic. Uh, it is believed that, that both victims uh, suffered from uh, substance abuse issues. Uh, they were, you know, fighting addiction. Um, both of them did have history where, as part of that addiction, they engaged in prostitution. And we believe this is something that he frequented. Uh, in addition to that, his history in Brazil indicated that uh, he was a person of interest in many violent crimes against uh, prostitutes in that country as well. Um, well, at the point in time at which she was missing, this all happened pretty quickly, actually. Um, by the time I was notified exactly what had happened, I mean, we had done personal searches and stuff, and uh, her addiction had taken her to different places. Things were, you know, I had no idea. Um, I'm sorry. Let's get rid of that. Um, by the time I had finally found out the Cooper City Police Department it had come up to my house and uh, obviously, um, you know, being a, a possible suspect and all of it brought me in, you know, did their jobs. Um, and, and as far as the rest of it goes, the rest of it is all with the police departments. I, I couldn't tell you what happened from those points on. Um, I, I came to grips with this a long time ago. Um, it, it's part of a disease that we both shared. Um, as far as, you know, how the rest of the family handled it, we, we huddled together. You know, it, it's how we've handled all of it. That was basically about the size of that one. Michael, do you all have any reason to believe that she knew I, I have no idea that would be for the detectives. Anything else for either staff or the investigators? Um, for any of you, what, what did uh, you, Mr. Fernandez do for a living while he was here in, in uh, South Florida? So uh, we understand that uh, Mr. Fernandez was working for a, as I said before during the synopsis, um, he was working for a company um, that did tours uh, throughout Miami. Uh, and he was driving one of those vans that belonged to the company um, that he was uh, later, you know, that was later found at his apartment. Uh, we also understand that he was a flight attendant at some point, um, being that the um, 
Ms. Good had spoken to her boyfriend and told her the night before that uh, she was in the area of Lejeune um, when she met this white Hispanic male. Um, the area that she would have been picked up in uh, is pretty close to the airport. So it's possible that had some type of tie, the fact that he was a flight attendant and may be visiting Miami frequently, close to the airport, uh, may have tied it all together. And can you spell your name, please, sir? Sir, uh, T is in Tom, R I, F is in Frank, O N is in November, O V is in Victor. How, how far back did you say that he's been doing his murders? I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, obviously, we know from uh, the year 2000 um, that B uh, Broward Sheriff's Office has been investigating, and then our murder was in 2001. Um, that's all I could tell you as far as our, our knowledge. I got a question. I'm confused on the timeline. You said uh, he was found and, they, and, they, and found that the van was a clue of the phone number, but that seems like it would go pretty quick. Why did it take till 2005 to you know figure out, or after that, to figure out where he was? I don't, I don't understand. Like That seems like after a few days, you're gonna know that that van connects you. But then why, where, why did it take so long to get to him? Sure. So shortly after uh, our murder, uh, when investigators were uh, making moves to go and contact him and bring him in for questioning, unfortunately, they had already found out that he had fled uh, the country to Brazil. Um, so the investigation was still ongoing uh, to develop probable cause. And uh, once they were uh, able to develop probable cause, Obviously, uh, being in another country and Brazil not extraditing um, our criminals uh, back to the states, that caused uh, a lot of hurdles for us and a lot of red tape. Um, so we had to work with Brazilian authorities uh, to bring this to a close and to further our investigation. Uh, that, that all takes some time. Yes, so, there, so what we, we understand is uh, sometime in 2005, he had left Brazil, uh, possibly uh, trying to escape prosecution uh, for uh, the possible murder of his wife and maybe other things that he had done there. Uh, the flight that he had taken in 2005 from Brazil to Paraguay crashed, and that's when we learned that uh, he may have died in that plane crash. Um, going back to uh, what I had said before, that does take time to confirm a death. Um, and there's, there was a lot of fraud going on, as is today, as was uh, back then, uh, of people assuming other people's identities, um, and we had to confirm that death, you know, because people do fake their death. And the Broward connection was only made after his body was exhumed and everything was in the same database? Once the body was exhumed and we were able to confirm who was in that grave, we were able to confirm that Robert Fernandez was deceased, we were able to confirm that that DNA did belong to Robert Fernandez, and that's what really tied up everything and brought it all to a close for uh, both of our agencies. And sir, your, your first name and, and rank? Sergeant uh, Rank and Nikolai, N-I-K-O-L-A-I is my first name, sir. Okay, thank you. Sir. Zach, you have something to add on that one? Yes. Sure. Just to kind of clarify on some of this, so uh, the Jessica Good mur murder happened August 30th of 2001, uh, Fernandez left the country September 1st. Uh, he fled the country immediately. The connection to the Brower cases actually didn't occur until 2011 when all the profiles connected in the national database to the profile identifies belonging to Roberto Fernandez. Uh, at that point is when investigators went to Brazil and Mr. Fernandez had been deceased at six years at that point. Uh, to your earlier question as far as how long, uh, we know he obtained his first driver's license in the States in 1999. Uh, we believe he was probably back and forth between Brazil and the States several times prior to them between 96 and 99. Uh, unfortunately, in doing this investigation, a lot of the travel records prior to 9-11 were not as stringent, they were not as documented. So we're dealing with kind of a loose window as far as his arrival in the U.S. We do know he fled in September of uh, 2001, and he did not return to the States. Um, in Brazil, he is a licensed pilot, so he may have traveled to other countries, there's no question. 
Um, part of the reason that we did want to make this announcement today is that you know, personally, someone who has this type of uh, violence towards their victims and disregard for life, uh, I, I find it hard to believe that they limited themselves to three victims. I believe there are other cases out there and that is part of our ongoing investigation. I wouldn't limit it to locally. Uh, again, um, we, we can tell you he was in this country during that time frame, but I, there was no limit to where he may have traveled. Um, uh, what the sergeant had mentioned as far as his trades working with tour groups and the airport and things along those lines, there were several other connections made to the airport. In fact, the suitcase uh, that we believe was recovered from uh, Kim's crime scene was actually stolen from Miami International Airport uh, about five, six months prior, we believe. Uh, so we, we feel that that may be kind of a connecting point for his travel routes and things along those lines, but I wouldn't limit it to this area. Did the Missourian uh, Police Department inform you guys that they suspected him of other previous murders? Yes, he actually in 2003 was identified as a suspect in a rape. Uh, and that may have also led to his trying to flee uh, to Paraguay. Um, and there were several other times where his name was certainly as a person of interest in violent crimes against women in Brazil. Do you all believe that he always worked alone, or do you think that there could be an accomplice out there? At this point, we have no indication based on any physical evidence or any type of testimony to indicate that there was anybody but him involved. Uh, but we, we certainly would consider that as a possibility. Were there any similarities in the uh, profiles of the victims? Uh, any similarities that connected the dots um, in the victims? Uh, all three of the victims all had addiction issues. Uh, all three were known to uh, engage in prostitution in the same area of Miami. Um, you know, both the Brower cases both their victims were, their bodies were left in Broward County where they both uh, resided at least for some significant time in their lives. Um, outside of that, I, I believe personally that it was more victims of opportunity for him. When you guys uh, identified Fernandez as the, as the murderer, how do you work forward? How do you match up like other cases, cold cases in, in the area or anything? We would try to find characteristics of the murders that were unique or at least distinct to those crimes. And then we would look at our other unsolved uh, and surrounding areas unsolved. Um, we try to have open department communication to share that information so that if there are cases that fit the same characteristics, we can then go that step further and try to see if there's anything physically uh, with the evidence that we can use to confirm or deny. Uh, whether or not that person's involved. Um, and a lot of it is just talking to people. I mean, you know, 20 years is a long time. Someone didn't want to come forward with something they thought was irrelevant 20 years ago. If we go back and ask that question now, suddenly it could be very relevant. Well, thank you all for uh, your questions and your patience. And once again, Michael, thank you for coming out uh, and all the patience and never losing confidence uh, within this organization or law enforcement in general. I think that's a testament to your own commitment to see justice take place.